Good morning again. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure and honor to, to introduce um, our keynote speaker today, uh, uh, Carrie C. Barshamer, professor in the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina, uh, Dr. Gary Marcianini. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with his work, uh, which uh, his record is quite impressive, and I'm just going to give a, a short survey of uh, some of the things, he, uh, some of the fields he's worked in, because we do have limited time. Uh, but uh, Professor Marcianini has made numerous contributions to information uh, interaction, human-computer interaction, human-centered computing, information retrieval, digital libraries, information architecture, digital, digital government, cyberspace identity, information policy, and I'm sure I'm leaving out about half a dozen things. Um, and while embracing the, the benefits of technology, his research is always focused on people and, and the role that people play in, in, in the space, which is quite important, I think. He's also contributed um, through uh, organizing numerous conferences, editing academic journals and other publications. He's been the president of ACES. And recently, he made the ultimate sacrifice by becoming dean. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, uh, I'd like to add that uh, Professor Marcinini uh, can be quite creative with words. And he's given us such terms as and I'm going to take a minute to pronounce this one, uh, siminforosis, uh, sharium, and, of course, HCIR. Please welcome Dr. Gary Marcinini. Uh, well, he didn't say that um, you, you, uh, you're going to be uh, disabused uh, today by someone who doesn't even know how to pronounce his last name, so he can't have done very much. <laughs> Every time I go to Europe, I get um, uh, harangued by folks who say, what? How did you do that to that, that Marchionini euphony? Okay, so um, uh, just to uh, get us started here, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for all being here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, uh, it's really... Um, uh, quite a humbling experience. Uh, you know, Daniel and Ryan have sort of been the, uh, the, the main organizers and uh, sort of heart of, of, of this uh, series of workshops from the beginning. Uh, Bill, Kathy, Rob have sort of really stepped up and, and bolstered the community. Uh, uh, Dan, a, a longtime member of the community, uh, uh, more broadly, uh, is uh, to be thanked for hosting us. And uh, uh, there's just kind of an interesting synergy between the, those of us who sort of made um, CHI uh, our home uh, or SIGI our home or were schizophrenic and uh, would uh, sort of try to go to both of them and um, uh, learn from uh, really two different, I think, fundamental points of view uh, about uh, how people interact with computers. And so uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of context for HCIR and uh, then uh, focus on some cases uh, based on um, uh, work that uh, my uh, students, colleagues, uh, and I have done over the years. So a lot of this will be a, a little bit self-centered. I apologize for that in advance. Um, that I'll try to uh, also be a little bit self-critical. And then uh, really talk about challenges uh, and, and the sticky part, the hard part. Uh, and I think the hard part in our field, uh, if this is a field, is evaluation and uh, how we're able to um, uh, really uh, demonstrate that our results are robust and uh, extensible. So um, a little bit of history here, History 101. Um, I, I could have had, I started to put lots of names on this and I thought, oh, this is going crazy, I can't do this. So let me uh, sort of emphasize a couple of names that maybe you haven't heard. Uh, people who back in the 70s were actually doing work at a time when, uh, before, certainly before the web, when the way retrieval got done was you'd have a, a person, you'd have some kind of system, uh, and then there would be an intermediary, a real life person, usually we called them librarians. Uh, and uh, you, you would uh, talk to the librarian, and they would do what's called a reference interview, uh, which uh, could be quite extensive or it could be fairly cursory, and then they would go search for you. In those early days when um, uh, uh, everything except maybe the ERIC database cost a lot of money to search per, per unit time, and so no one could be trusted to actually go and do your own searches. Uh, and um, 
Um, uh, as a little ironic uh, sort of anecdote, uh, one of our uh, uh, great colleagues, uh, uh, Chris Borgman, her mother was uh, a librarian at uh, Wayne State University where I was doing uh, my PhD, and uh, she did my Eric searches. And I, you know, we, we discovered this uh, sometime later, yeah. And, and I, I vividly remember going into the library, and I had been used to going and doing my own searches in printed indexes, uh, it's painful stuff. And uh, you know, you write down something, and then hopefully it's somewhere in uh, the stacks. And I heard about this uh, new service, and so I went and talked to this very nice lady who um, actually did a fairly extensive interview, and um, uh, and then through the campus pickup sent me printouts of um, uh, bibliographic citations. Uh, you know, a week or two later, uh, and uh, you know that's the way you know, retrieval used to get done. And there, there are people, uh, you know, who were studying the intermediaries, especially uh, folks, uh, um, I think uh, Don Hawkins is here, actually, um, in the audience. Um, uh, Charlie Meadow, uh, who was, came out of dialogue and sort of joined the academy. Um, you know, the, the usual names you would expect to see, you know, Tefko Sarachevic and uh, Dan Russell, George Furness. Uh, um, I put Karen Spark Jones in there uh, because I think she actually uh, had a lot of um, um, appreciation for the human side of, of um, retrieval. You know, we have the luminaries, uh, the, the pioneers on the IR side, uh, the, you know, the Saltons, Van Reisenbergs, uh, Cross, and so on. We have the pioneers on the HCI side, um, you know, the, the Normans and, and uh, et al. Um, and there were a couple of folks, um, you know, Ben Schneiderman, Stu Card, for example, who not only were doing the you know, founding sort of HCI, but they sort of were working in the area of information seeking. Um, there, um, Pauline Co Cochran, another name you may not uh, sort of be so familiar with, uh, studied uh, OPACs. Um, uh, Richard Marcus, a guy at MIT uh, Libraries, who was trying to develop expert systems that would uh, emulate uh, uh, search intermediaries and doing really interesting stuff that certainly influenced some of my thinking when I uh, sort of first came um, uh, to the field in the, the early 80s. Um, uh, folks out at um, uh, in, in London, uh, Michelle Hancock, Bellu, uh, um, uh, Steve Robertson, Stephen Walker. Uh, I think we're doing really cool things with OPACs uh, that uh, uh, influence a lot of uh, what went on in, in the retrieval communities. But they were doing it from a from a human side. And uh, if there are two people, I guess who I would say are are kind of um, well, Sue's not here, but she'll kill me. Um, you know mother and father um, <laughs> of, of, of uh, HCIR, it's, 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 it's probably uh, Sue DeMay and um, uh, Nick Belkin, <laughs> uh, who uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing that, between, that no two people have more papers at SIGIR and HCI than uh, the two of them. So there's a rich history here, and um, uh, I think what's happening is we're starting to see some of this gelling as um, uh, um, sort of uh, newer generations of people uh, you know, really sort of make a difference. Uh, Marty Hurst is here, who sort of uh, put faceted uh, uh, on, on the on the map from the HCI point of view, uh, and um, uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, other others uh, who have really, I guess, brought us to where we are today. So these little pictures, to me, are meaningful. Um, the important thing is that that green face. The intermediary has disappeared. Yeah, so from the sort of uh, early the 70s and probably early 80s, uh, there were these intermediaries, and I, su I suspect that uh, going back and trying to understand what people were trying to uh, uh, learn from studies of intermediaries uh, is is probably something that would be worth um, sort of revisiting, given the tools and the technologies that we have today. So that's kind of the, go back and do, do a little history, uh, and we might discover some things. Uh, certainly, the, the 80s and 90s, we, uh, we got the web. Uh, we got this um, uh, intermediary disappeared, but also the database, instead of it being this kind of plain vanilla uh, text database that was bibliographic in nature, we got multimedia, we got uh, connectivity through the web, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, things began to really change. Uh, and and uh, the current state of affairs uh, today uh, extends that with lots and lots more people if we consider what's going on sort of with social media. Right? So that not only do we have 
those that incredibly rich uh, uh, database, if you will, uh, that system, uh, we, we also now have a lot more humans involved. And so this, uh, this is our time. I mean, if, if we really are thinking about uh, taking the, the, the human side uh, of, of retrieval, then uh, there are a whole lot more humans out there. And the one thing that uh, I guess has always uh, sort of bugged me is that we haven't really had a, had a good way to leverage human intelligence during the search process. It typically either is all on the human or we sort of turn over everything to the, the system side. And that delicate sort of back and forth interaction is, uh, is really, I think, what this um, sort of subfield is about. OK, so to um, uh, move along here, uh, now that you had your history lesson, um, let me do a, a few little case studies. I'll uh, start with open video, which uh, is uh, uh, a, a, a platform for research first, and a service to the community second, uh, and then probably an educational outreach um, uh, uh, sort of project uh, third. And uh, over the years, uh, those um, three kinds of roles have, uh, have um, interacted and, and switched around. The or original notion was to try and provide the you know, basic search, it wasn't fancy search, it was uh, sort of just keyword-based uh, search using uh, the standard uh, sort of uh, MySQL type uh, uh, out-of-the-box uh, search uh, based on some pretty good metadata, and then faceted selection. And that's where I think we, we made some um, uh, interesting uh, inroads. And we we're dealing with video, so things like genre became uh, kind of an important facet, uh, you know, not just things like topic and, and, and person. So um, uh, that, that was sort of one direction. The second big uh, theme is uh, this sort of layers of representation in the search engine result page, in the, in the results themselves, but, but also for the objects. Uh, the, the notion uh, was that video is, uh, can, be, can generate sort of big files. And so before you actually download a video, you really want to know a lot more about that video uh, before you make that sort of commitment. Now, that was, you know, 10 plus years ago, but I think it still remains true that the idea of looking ahead is really important. And how do you look ahead? Well, you look ahead by having representations that are sort of cascading. Now, in our sense, they tended to be hierarchical uh, in, or of going from sort of um, a broader down to narrower, although I don't see any reason why they couldn't be lateral as well. Um, and we sort of developed what we called the Agile Views framework in that what we wanted to give people were Agile Views. They could change their view very quickly. So you could look from the, the overall corpus uh, sliced up by facets uh, very quickly at some sub um, uh, partition of that database, if you will. Uh, and from there, you could look at individual objects. You could go back and look at subsets. Uh, and you could look at abbreviations or what we call surrogates. And uh, I think the surrogate work has really probably been the hallmark of the Open Video Project over the, the last decade. Uh, I distinguish surrogates from metadata and that surrogates are really meant for people, whereas metadata um, very often is meant for machines or people, but uh, it's, it's really useful for machines. Uh, and and uh, surrogates really are designed for people. And so the, the notion of asking the question, what are appropriate surrogates for video objects? And then um, trying to empirically investigate those different kinds of surrogates has been uh, pretty much the, uh, the bulk of the work uh, that um, uh, has been done uh, by mainly uh, fantastic students. Um, the, the kinds of, of surrogates that uh, we were mainly interested in from the visual side were things like fast forwards, storyboards, poster frames. Uh, the kinds of surrogates we're interested in from the audio uh, point of view are snippets. Um, can't really do so much fast forwards with, uh, with uh, audio. Uh, even visual representations for audio when that's appropriate. It sort of overloads the, uh, the visual channel if you're also using them in conjunction with, uh, with visual surrogates. And, and then how those things interact became sort of the 
the most recent kind of uh, dissertation uh, that came out of that, that was uh, Yishal Song's uh, work. Um, one of the things to me that's been most interesting about open video is how well it stood up as, uh, from an interface point of view, um, Gary Geisler, here somewhere, um, uh, was the uh, uh, designer of that interface, and I think it's a testament to his um, uh, skill at, at, and, uh, and careful uh, um, uh, perception uh, about what would work that has, has made that interface uh, stand up over time. Uh, there are a lot of studies uh, that came out of, out of this in four dissertations, but the most sort of rewarding thing for me, and this will sort of um, serve as a counterpoint for some of the things I'll talk about shortly, is that the framework for looking at video, uh, I think, makes sense. Uh, we, we try to um, uh, actually create not only tasks, but stimuli that were appropriate to video. They, they weren't text-based. Uh, I mean, there were text-based uh, uh, sort of stimuli, but uh, they were really uh, meant to um, uh, sit in the context in which people do video retrieval. Uh, the takeaway message, uh, I guess, for me is, is that there's this kind of interaction between research practice and mixed methods. Most of the studies that were done um, were lab studies, kind of, you know, classical um, uh, user studies. Uh, but there were a number of, um, of qualitative studies. Um, uh, Meng Yang's dissertation uh, did in intensive uh, interviews with three different uh, kinds of users of video uh, to try and, and, and uh, sort of determine roles. Uh, uh, but most of the studies here were actually looked at um, uh, uh, through the lens of the laboratory study. And um, uh, I think there's some contributions uh, uh, from, from that sort of point of view I'll get to in a second. Um, you know, here's, here's and just one example. Certainly not going to go through a whole bunch of, bunch of uh, screen dumps here. You can go to the website and uh, check it out. It still works, uh, which is kind of amazing after 10 years. Um, and these were the three kinds of storyboards that people could, or uh, sorry, uh, three kinds of visual surrogates people could uh, uh, select. Uh, there were other levels of representation where people actually were making choices about what um, uh, to look at next. Because it's always a matter of, uh, asking yourself, should I go further? Is this still interesting? Is this worth going down that path any further? Uh, and my, my estimation is that only in the very simplest cases of, of, of sort of known item lookup is that question uh, always uh, uh, um, uh, an easy one. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of, do I know enough? Have I learned enough? Um, I want to sort of do a quick little um, um, transition here. This is an old uh, interface that was done uh, pr probably uh, late, uh, late 90s, probably 1996, I think, uh, was when this, this particular one was, was put together. This is the Baltimore Learning Community. Uh, we were working with schools uh, in the city of Baltimore and uh, the Discovery Channel and a few other, uh, Apple, I guess, was a partner at that time. And the, the notion was to try and give teachers uh, a small digital library of science and social studies materials that they could then build into their lessons, okay, in their lesson plans. And uh, this was inspired, of course, by um, uh, the work at the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory on dynamic queries and the, uh, what we were calling Starfield displays. Uh, and the way this works is the facets on the left were topical or that was the topical facet, uh, the categories uh, within the topic facet. And the, uh, the categories across the horizontal uh, axis that are kind of, uh, 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 can't read there because of the overlays, were the actual standards. So those were standards for the, from the Social Studies uh, Teachers Association and the Science Teachers Association. And so what people could do is say, well, I'm interested in this standard and I'm interested in the topic of I don't know, ecology. And they could see uh, pretty quickly that there were a lot of blue dots and a few yellow dots. And uh, those represented different kinds of objects. The objects were videos, um, text, and uh, images. And if they clicked on one of those small partitions, they would get the uh, pop-up on the right, which was sort of the, the metadata for that subcluster. Uh, it's kind of like a search engine result page, if you will. And uh, they could then scroll through there. And as they scrolled, 
the bibliographic or metadata for each of those objects would show up. And in the case of the visual surrogate, those were, um, we were, were just uh, slideshows. So if you click on uh, or, or hovered over, uh, I, think that, yeah, I think that was a click um, on the um, uh, image, you would then get, in this case, a storyboard. We also fooled around with uh, doing these uh, little uh, uh, flashing uh, uh, slideshows of, of the same key frames. So this was kind of the inspiration for open video uh, before I moved to uh, North Carolina. Uh, I still think this is a useful interface, and I guess I've, I've tried to have people implement it. Uh, this was done in like the original Java, um, you know, the buggy old the stuff from the mid-90s. And um, uh, I haven't quite seen this done in a way that makes sense. Now, it's not going to work for the entire web, right? Uh, it would work for a fairly small-sized, let's say 100, 100K or fewer kinds of elements, a database. Or it might work, and this is where I think it has some potential, for a, a, search, uh, a, a search results uh, uh, kind of uh, cluster of things, right? In which you said, OK, I've done my usual web-based search. Uh, let, let me now visualize it in a way that is, is dynamic. Lots of stuff has to go on in the background here, right? I mean, you got to have good metadata, otherwise this doesn't work at all. Uh, and so uh, we did a lot of work with trying to automatically generate metadata using machine learning techniques and, 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 and other things. And uh, it's OK. I mean, it, it'll, it, it actually does well enough to make this um, um, uh, a, a, a viable way to go. So I'm kind of waiting for folks to uh, go back to these kinds of, of UIs after people have sort of done the, the search engine magic. Um, we move to a, a second case here, the relation browser. Uh, this is another, um, I mean, I, I guess I, I think of it as a project. Uh, it's, it's a way for, for us to think about a problem, uh, to build something that might actually be useful, uh, and uh, to study uh, human interaction. Unlike open video, which actually had a system, had some data behind it, and uh, continues to be used by lots and lots of people, especially teachers uh, and artists around the world. Um, the uh, relation browser was really more of a, well, what if we could actually do some kind of dynamic query widget? And uh, uh, let's push on, on that and see if, we, if people could sort of plug, plug it into things. Uh, again, the notion uh, uh, behind it was, can, can we do this look ahead without penalty, uh, where people through brushing or mousing activities get looks into what will happen if they take a more, uh, let me say, um, aggressive action. So a click is an aggressive action. It used to be much more painful when you clicked on something because you had to wait longer. You know, now you, know, you click and you can sort of undo it. It's not such a penalty. But before you click, the, act the action of brushing can give you kind of a look ahead. Uh, so that was part of the, the motivation here. But more importantly, this is user driven. So it's like, how can the user take control rather than having the system be, be sort of spurting out uh, suggestions or, or um, uh, trying to uh, sort of drive the user toward the answer or, or set of answers? The other important aspect that was uh, uh, important, uh, too many importance there, uh, in um, uh, the relation browser work was being able to see relationships between and among different categories within the, the facets. And uh, I'll see if I can demonstrate that in a second. Um, and, and that this, this was about exploration rather than search. Uh, remember when we first uh, implemented this at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, uh, the, there, were, there were a couple of, most people got it, but there were a couple of people who just thought it was about search and they just never quite sort of, sort of saw the, uh, the, the power of that. I think we, we sort of were able to win them over, uh, over time, but the, it really in, empowered exploration. And with exploration, the expectation should not be the kind of precision that we would have in, with really um, high quality search whole lot of uh, implementations over the years. Uh, ben Brunk was sort of the uh, original um, developer of, of, of early relation browsers. Uh, Anita, I think uh, you probably spent some time at BLS doing user studies uh, in, the, in those early days. Um, 
Um, uh, Rob Capra has uh, sort of taken over, uh, well, um, he, he got stuck with, actually, um, a couple of years ago, um, um, doing sort of a more up-to-date version of the Relation Browser. Um, uh, and, and we've done a number of studies, not as many as with open video, but most of these were laboratory studies. Uh, we had, I think the one field study we did was at BLS where we actually mounted it, and because it was a government agency, we couldn't put it on the home page, and so you had to actually go a couple of clicks down before you could actually, you know, do the survey and, you know, sort of you know, give some feedback. Uh, but most of these were laboratory studies, and I'm going to speak to uh, one particular laboratory study that I think demonstrates um, um, some of the tension between trying to do serious laboratory evaluation and um, uh, having probably too many variables. Um, for, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, you know, earlier version, uh, basically as, uh, and this, this was I guess for the um, uh, Energy Information Administration, we did this one, and as you, as you brush over the, um, uh, the type of, of, uh, of, of energy, all the other things, geography, sector, uh, uh, and will update immediately. So that what you're able to do, it's a really sort of primitive data mining sort of uh, tool. Uh, and it severely depends on really good metadata. Secondly, it severely depends on having all the metadata on the client side which is really problematic if you want to actually do this at scale beyond, say, 100,000 or so kind of items. Uh, so, you know, if you're willing to pay a little bit of a price of waiting for the metadata to come to your client, uh, then you can actually have this very dynamic kind of, of, of system where everything is connected. And as you're brushing over any one of the facets, you actually see immediately where, how it relates across all the other facets. So it's a, it's, it's a really powerful way to look at things, but you can't do it with many millions of items, at least um, uh, I don't know how to do that. I think it's a good computer science, uh, technology, engineering type challenge, uh, but um, uh, it, it has, again, some possibilities for, all right, I've now narrowed my results down to 50,000 or, or some, something that's somewhat reasonable. I'm willing to pay the price of waiting in a 10 seconds or, or so, three seconds, whatever it takes, for the metadata to come uh, to the client side, and now I can really do dynamic things with it. Uh, and I, we're, we're still not quite there, uh, except for um, sort of databases that are, are kind of more well-behaved. The right side is uh, Rob's uh, version for some work we did with um, uh, the Science and Engineering Indicators uh, in the National, Re uh, National Science Council. So here's the study that um, I'll sort of self-criticize. Uh, and I, I think this, this is actually perhaps a little bit, in my experience, uh, too typical. Maybe it's just because um, uh, I'm not uh, discriminating enough or I can't sort of parse away uh, some of the variables that I'd really like to study. Um, part of it is that these things, uh, as many of you know, uh, evolve over a long period of time. Uh, I sort of am jealous of my colleagues uh, who work uh, in you know, the, the search engine companies because they can actually run things really quickly um, in a university setting. Uh, you know, you know how this works, right? You you get the grant, uh, you assemble the team. The team um, is completely dependent on semesters, not unlike you know any other real time sort of thing. But when people you know come come to campus and all that. And then you have meetings, uh, weekly meetings at least, uh, and you sit around and you say, well, what, you know, how do we sort of partition the right question, the right uh, variables to, um, uh, and it's great for students uh, because, you know, they, they see all the complications of doing a user study. And, you know, if they happen to have come from um, computer science uh, or engineering, uh, they get kind of frustrated. Some of them even, you know, manage to stick around like Chirag uh, and, you know, not say, this is too crazy, I can't do this. Um, uh, and, and so um, uh, for the, from the student's point of view, it's a great learning experience. But from a kind of overall moving the science ahead, 
there's a lot to be um, criticized. So here's a study that um, we did. I, I don't know, Jan, were you involved in this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, we were interested in this uh, relation browser in, in instance. Uh, we, um, we were still working with BL, the Bureau of Labor Statistics kind of data. Um, so we, were, we really wanted to look at search tasks, simple lookup, more complex lookup. The simple lookup was just you know, pretty much a, a single um, sort of concept. Uh, the complex lookup had not, not only multiple concepts, but uh, the, the more abstraction in, in the concepts. And then the exploratory search that was uh, um, uh, much more open-ended. We're also interested in different sort of user interfaces. And, uh, on, and here's where I think things really went probably a little bit too, uh, too far. Uh, we were interested in the actual architecture and the interaction style. The interaction style being kind of query versus um, um, uh, selection or browsing, and the uh, architecture being really well-formulated, user-generated metadata that's hierarchically <laughs> presented at, uh, or, or presented in a, in a, in a human-centric sort of way versus uh, automatically mined meta, uh, metadata in our relation browser instance. So we probably needed to have actually more variations of the user interface, but you know the problem there. Um, to, where would we get all the subjects, right? Uh, and so uh, the, the, the problem was, was probably overly ambitious in terms of these two sets of independent variables. And so we, we did two three by three kinds of designs, with, uh, one between subjects and one within subjects, which also complicates things. Now imagine writing the methodology section for a CHI or SIG IR paper, in which you probably have like one column or like maybe a page where you can explain this. And you're trying to explain all of those decisions you've made after sitting in a room together for a year or something like a year to make all these decisions, right? Um, and this is, I think, the heart of our problem, is how do we actually capture all of that thinking that goes in, the, ra the rationale, the reasoning, for the kinds of studies we do. And we're always sort of interested in just the results. But I would claim that uh, sort of our design competition, the, the, the challenge here uh, that uh, um, uh, started last year may give us a little bit of leverage to begin to push on, on that problem. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. And, and I, I would suggest in the age of data, which you know, we hear all the time, we're in the age of data. We somehow regressed from information. But, um, anyway, um, we, uh, that, that we uh, probably should make these, these processes more visible to people. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a, a real good solution uh, on this, but I hope you'll, you'll think about it. Now, not only did we have two pretty complicated independent variables, but we had a lot of dependent variables. And, and this is, I think, fine. I think this is, this is actually a, a very good thing to do. The problem is when you very often find when you're dealing with humans that uh, it's hard to get high correlations between your dependent variables in the sort of direction you'd like them to be in. And so um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's another one of, one of the things that, that sort of causes us to have to be somewhat apologetic when we go to, say, SIG IR community and say, take my paper, uh, or even the CHI community. So um, what did we learn from this really complicated, you know, literally, I think, did take a year to plan this, the study, to build all of the, the, the stimuli, the different tools, the system that collected the data and, and um, uh, sort of uh, ran, ran the study in, in a controlled sort of way. Uh, well, we learned that um, you know, automatically classifying uh, some of the, well, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, uh, web pages was, was okay. I mean, it certainly wasn't as good as what BLS had done by their handcrafting uh, over the years. Uh, but, you know, it, it did all right. Uh, and uh, the, the other thing that was painful to learn was that the plain old BLS website was preferred to our really cool interfaces, you know? And, and, uh, and even from our sort of the in-between faceted uh, sort of browser that we, we built as kind of this intermediary. And, you know, it's about familiarity and comfort levels, I, I think. Um, 
you know, maybe that's a rationalization. Um, but it, it's that kind of, of message that um, is really difficult to sort of explain to people. Well, what did you learn? What, was your system better? Did it win? Uh, what's better about it? Mm, well, um, uh, 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 yeah, it, it was pretty good. Um, um, so how do we get over this? Um, well, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answers uh, to, to that question. Uh, I, will, I will end on sort of a discussion uh, about um, one partic particular aspect. But let me go to a sort of a third case, one that's still going on now, um, uh, the results-based project, which is a little bit newer, uh, probably four years or so um, now. The, the notion here is you know, how can we actually support results? Uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the fact that you've done a query and you get stuff back is pretty much the end of story for a lot of search, right? Uh, but it's certainly not the end of story for humans uh, because you know, that's actually kind of only the beginning. And how do we be, begin to give people better results page? It's, it's pretty amazing that lists of snippets still work as well as they, as they do. Uh, I, uh, uh, can't we do better? So the notion here was, can we begin to get beyond the query and search uh, uh, sort of part to examining results, manipulating results, uh, and possibly doing so in collaboration. So the notion was searches over time and possibly in collaboration. And the, the, the main sort of system uh, uh, advance that came out of this was uh, Chirag's uh, Coagmento system, which uh, supported uh, collaborative synchronous search. And... Um, um, uh, I have to hand it to Chirag for recruiting all of those dyads of people who, who came to multiple sessions in this dingy old little room in the ceiling of Manning Hall and uh, actually showed up twice and all of that. Uh, just logistical nightmare, right? Um, and, um, uh, and yet uh, he was able to sort of pull this off and, and, and demonstrate that this awareness of what people are doing while you're uh, searching with them is really pretty important. And, and how can we begin to take advantage of that awareness uh, and make it more informative uh, and revealing uh, to, to partners uh, is, uh, is, is uh, I think, the main uh, outcome of, of, of that work. Um, right now, uh, Rob Capra and um, Jaime Arguello are, uh, and I, not, well, I have less than I'd like, um, are working on um, uh, looking at, at a, a similar kind of study with asynchronous collaboration. Uh, as, as people are not actually working in real time together, uh, how can we provide support for them? Uh, what's the value of actually having a sort of a, a strategy meeting at the beginning where you say, okay, we're going we're gonna to do what uh, uh, Gene and Jeremy have sort of suggested with roles uh, and ass assign roles or assume roles or uh, we're going to uh, divide and conquer. Uh, how, what's the value of that versus just going at it, and letting people sort of uh, do searching uh, on their own? So stay tuned on that, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what, what we can discover. I guess here there have been a, probably a more e equitable um, uh, set of field studies versus laboratory studies. I still like the laboratory studies. I'd really love to uh, sort of get the perfect laboratory study to work. I've yet to have one of those. Um, but uh, uh, the field studies actually, my sort of experience, have taught me specific insights uh, where you sort of say, oh, wow, I didn't sort of think of that. And then that may be become, become the basis for something that you test in a laboratory study. I mean, that's the way, you know, your research methods class uh, would, uh, would tell you that it should work, um, and sometimes it actually does. Um, I guess one little anecdote uh, with um, some of our video work, when we were doing uh, studies of uh, audio surrogates and we were trying to look at the interaction, uh, you know, how, how valuable is it for visual surrogates and audio surrogates to be synchronized? 
Now we know that for video, if, if the audio and the visual are not synchronized, it's a bad scene, right? Uh, you never want that to happen. But I, I suspect that if people are really looking at surrogates, that assuming that we can believe uh, uh, the, the notion that we have multiple channels for processing um, you know, information, that we probably don't need to have those things actually coordinated because it's unlikely that the visual scene and the audio scene are both having the most salient piece of an entire video clip. The most salient visual might actually be different than where the audio is taking place. And so if you're showing people the visual, most salient audio, uh, visual scene, then maybe actually having them hear something else that's most salient is better. All right, so that's what we're trying to test. And uh, so it sounds great, right? Nice theoretical question. Sounds like a dissertation. Uh, and it was. Um, and uh, 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 yeah, we're, we're, we're doing these really cool studies. And look, I'm in the, the lab watching people do the study. And I see that there are folks who are in the, in the three conditions, you know, the pure visual, the pure audio, and the mixed. And there are people in the mixed who are closing their eyes while they're listening <laughs> or looking away, right? Now, I never would have sort of, you know, thought of that or see, or uh, yeah, that wasn't part of what we were uh, trying to learn, but that's the way people are, right? They're actually pretty smart. Uh, and so if we don't have that kind of combination of the ability to look at the sort of field uh, uh, environment, uh, the natural environment, then our laboratory studies are, are going to be somewhat uh, impoverished. Um, you're, this is a theme you'll hear again and again. So let's get to the heart of the talk. Challenges. They're about evaluation, I think. And a lot of this is about um, sort of mixing methods, um, you know, integrating the quantitative and qualitative people. And I think um, uh, the, the information schools uh, have, have actually done a pretty good job of, of doing that integration. Uh, it's, you know, it's still bumpy. Um, you might, you know, if you want to go back to the old AI um, sort of um, uh, Raising, uh, can we get the neats and the scruffies to work together? I don't think there's about human interaction by just doing laboratory studies, and you can't learn by just doing the, the, the field studies. Uh, I think they really have to uh, go hand in hand. I just don't have a good algorithm for that. I mean, the, my sense is to say, well, the, the, the natural studies, the qualitative type studies, should probably come first. And that then allows you to generate hypotheses that you can test in the laboratory. Um, but I think it actually can work the other way as well. And so this is something I, I guess I'd like to hear some discussion about if you've had experiences going the other way. Ra you're doing some, some um, uh, laboratory studies that then, and not just because you got so frustrated from doing the laboratory studies that you, you know, sort of fell back to the qualitative, but were there some really uh, substantive things that occurred that, that uh, caused you to say, I really need to look at this in a much more uh, naturalistic and perhaps um, intensive, but not as expansive sort of, sort of way. Um, I think we have lots of challenges uh, uh, to understand information-seeking behavior. Uh, Getting beyond retrieval to extraction, uh, this, this notion that uh, it, it, it really has, we've gotten beyond the content uh, uh, becoming accessible, that my little uh, sort of uh, anecdote about doing the Eric search or, or having somebody do the Eric search for me, uh, you know, we're well beyond that. The content's there. It's actually not so much finding anymore. Uh, in fact, we find too much. Uh, but filtering and, and but we have to get to, into the content and it's right there in our face pretty quickly. So as that as that uh, becomes the norm, then the distinction between search and consumption of information, internalizing, learning, understanding, or as Dan would say, sense making, it, it grows less distinct. And so retrieval 
it, it's nice if you can just focus on retrieval, but you know, I, I, I don't want to say it's a done, it's a it's a solved problem because it certainly is not, but it's getting harder and harder to disambiguate the retrieval part from the consumption or, or learning part. And I claim that surrogates be, uh, are, 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 are more valuable as a result because they become the transitions uh, from the, uh, the retrieval to that deeper understanding. I think there are in, uh, there's a transition from individual to group uh, that uh, gives us some challenges. And of course, then the whole you know, user experience thing. So um, this is by no means a comprehensive list of sort of challenges, but uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, uh, I suggest we um, uh, should be wondering about. So query quality. Now you would think that this is a pretty basic concept, right? You know, if you can't judge whether this is a better query than that for a given problem, well, you probably don't have any business running a search engine. Um, but it's a really hard problem. And, and so you're trying to sort of take this sort of, usually the first signal that we get from a user and make some sense out of it to try and help them. Um, uh, David Carmel and um, uh, Yamtov have uh, uh, done a nice job of sort of looking at different strategies of pre-retrieval and post-retrieval sorts of approaches to this problem. Um, I apologize publicly to Ryan White for um, um, uh, working with him uh, on a study where he did all the great work and I tried to you know, uh, uh, deal with this query quality stuff and it just, it was, it was not quite hopeless, but it, we didn't get very far. Uh, uh, the, the notion was to try and have a panel of, of, uh, of non-search, of, of search experts, but uh, uh, people who weren't doing the searches, judge the post hoc quality of queries that had been expressed and, and uh, to, to see if, if uh, uh, we could uh, use that as a metric, and um, uh, it was you know, it was okay. I think the students uh, again the students learned something, um, and you know I I I find that um, unfortunately uh, uh, more and more that that's that's the not all I can say about a lot of our studies, but uh, it's um, you know it's not quite the the same thing as saying we advanced the science to the point where you know we now actually are able to do something a lot better and that's really what we want i mean that's what the nature of research is uh, and it's devilishly difficult uh, in this uh, this uh, realm uh, perhaps we can extend this and and say well okay um, what about the quality of user profiles is there a way that we can begin to assess the um, profiles that people express on the web, and you know, you can imagine all the different uh, social media profiles. Uh, not to mention the the cookies and things that uh, you know are on people's machines. And you know, how much confidence can we put in those profiles? And I don't know if the same kinds of techniques will work. Most of the techniques have been back-end sort of techniques in which you look at the documents or the, um, uh, in, if it were social media, the people. Uh, but uh, there, there may be some sort of front end uh, kinds of things we can do on, on query profiling. Um, you know, link densities, who knows. Um, how do we use search behavior as evidence? I mean, the actual behavior, not the end result. Uh, lots of work of this in the sort of um, implicit feedback and collaborative filtering um, uh, sort of uh, arena. Um, I want to sort of single uh, out uh, uh, Shin Fu, uh, who I, I think did a, a really interesting uh, methodological spin on, uh, on uh, this problem uh, to investigate implicit feedback. Instead of trying to say, well, you know, we're, the usual thing is to match queries to documents, he says, well, can we match queries, uh, uh, can we match the behaviors, the traces of search to queries? Uh, it was a clever um, uh, 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 strategy, created a corpus of queries, uh, they happened to be underspecified queries, uh, then got really rich captures of people doing those searches, including eye tracking, um, uh, 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 traces, and, and of course, law, uh, video logs. And uh, as well as the usual transaction logs. And then got a bunch of um, um, reference librarians, kind of expert searchers, who didn't know anything about these queries, to 
watch one of those different sets of traces and try to infer what were they looking for. And, at, and, and how did they make those, and, and of course articulate what the evidence they were using to make those inferences were. And do that um, using confidence in those inferences as one of the measures. So it's a very clever way to kind of um, reverse the process. And um, uh, I, I, I think that um, you know, what I'd like to see is, is kind of more ways of, of sort of thinking a little bit outside the box on the sort of the classic way of, okay, we're going to take these queries. Now let's see how these queries match onto documents or people or whatever we happen to be looking for. And uh, do a little bit of... Um, 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 around the block. In this case, the around the block was to bring back those intermediaries, those green faces that disappeared, um, you know, in 1980 or so. So um, my my own sort of, um, I guess, pet challenge is still, uh, how do we create effective surrogates? And then how do we measure their effectiveness? So this um, this little graphic is meant to suggest that there's, there's kind of a, uh, you, know, you might think of the two axes here as the, the vertical axis is effort, whatever, however you want to measure effort, and there are lots of different ways to think about it. And then um, the kind of complexity or abstraction on the horizontal axis, so you might, might operationalize that as the number of relationships that exist. Um, and there's this uh, sort of psychological process of recognizing uh, uh, well, per first per perceiving, then recognizing, making some quick sort of gisting um, uh, uh, assumptions, un something that we might call understanding, uh, and then all the way up through uh, uh, the, the usual um, uh, Bloom's taxonomy of, uh, of uh, uh, analyzing evaluation. And surrogates, I think, come in down here near the lower left-hand quadrant of, of this grid, and there's a lot to be said for work that A, creates novel kinds of surrogates, and B, tries to assess their efficacy. And um, uh, it, 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 uh, it seems to me that I, I, I personally would put some of my effort here uh, if I had any time lately. Um, there's some other challenges um, uh, about loads. Um, you know, cognitive load has uh, been well studied, uh, you know, with lots of good psychological studies. Uh, there's the sort of standard instruments like the TLX from NASA. People have used secondary tasks uh, to uh, try and uh, assess cognitive load. Great stuff. I love it. And I think we should continue to uh, you know, look at cognitive load. But there are other kinds of loads that I haven't seen as much of. So perceptual load. What's the perceptual load uh, of actually uh, uh, you know, working in this sort of web environment in which everything looks the same? You know, it's not like the real world where every time you go to a, a, you know, a different part of the, your office even, they're, they're, things are different. Uh, whereas here, it's, it's the same screen, it's the same keyboard, and uh, it's all coming through this kind of... Um, um, a single uh, kind of view. And so the perceptual load sorts of issues are, um, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, Felix Portnoy, a current student, is, has a hypothesis that for exploratory search, he's interested in banner ads and uh, you know, how, how people sort of get sort of used to those annoying ads and we never even see them anymore because we've sort of totally tuned them out. Well, have we really? Uh, uh, I don't think so, but somehow at the cognitive level we have. And so looking at the interaction of banner ad salience, the, the sort of intensity of, uh, of, of the, um, uh, the ad itself, and different search tasks is what uh, uh, he's studying. And I, I think um, that'll be one that you'll want to pay some attention to eventually. But the one that's probably most uh, of interest to us all here is, cog is co uh, collaborative load. So. Um, Shrag and I have had this um, uh, probably debate, I suppose, a friendly debate uh, for um, uh, uh, years now. Um, and, and I guess I'd like to suggest that you know, when two people work together, they're less efficient. I, I heard Eric say that. I can't wait for that poster. All right. So, uh, yeah, well, and we all know this. We all know this. You know, do a proposal with someone across campus, right? <laughs> I mean, how many meetings do you have to have before you really start? Oh, that's what you mean. Yeah, you know. It, yeah. So 
Now, the belief uh, and, 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 and the religion of the time is collaboration, interdisciplinary studies, you know, work together, all this. Yeah, there's something, there's something really good about this, but we're not really paying attention to what are the costs. So the, the study that we never did, um, that I'd still like to do, um, uh, there's a guy in journalism who has the same eye tracker as I do. And uh, we thought what would be kind of interesting is to look at people collaborating uh, across a distance and, look, uh, and, and sort of study the actual loading effects. Now, people have done this uh, in the CSCW community and the psychological community for looking at the channels uh, and sort of maintaining the, the actual communication channels. You know, you look at the word utterances, right, or the, type, uh, the, the typing streams, and you see how many of these can we classify as being, you know, just keeping the conversation going. Hey, hi, how you doing? Are you still there? You know, that sort of stuff. That's, that's a load, that's a cost. Uh, and it's, you know, it's necessary, but it's, it's there. So how, how do we begin to kind of minimize that in collaborative search? Um, all right, here's uh, sort of that big old challenge, um, you know, session quality, search quality, the overall problem solution. I mean, recall and precision, which we all love, uh, is, is, they're, they're point-based metrics. Uh, and uh, we have to keep that in mind. I mean, sometimes things get worse before they get better. And that should be taken into account in looking at the overall efficacy of, of a, 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 an information-seeking experience. Um, you know, I think I've said enough about controlling multiple variables. Um, there's this notion of the installed base. Um, the, the installed base uh, is uh, what people know and what people expect. And that continues to evolve. So it, you know, it's not fixed, right? Because people learn, they adopt new kinds of strategies, they become used to certain sorts of uh, uh, UIs or, or uh, interactions. And it's, it's kind of, you know, trying to change that is difficult. And it has to be um, uh, put into context. So my, my quiz is, here's a, um, a, a, a search session, let's say. And I don't care what kind of uh, measure you want on the um, uh, horizontal axis, uh, 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 vertical axis here, precision or recall, or how many smiles people make, which actually is not a bad measure. Um, and on the uh, horizontal axis are the different sort of acts. Let, you might think of them as queries, I suppose, or res, uh, result um, sets. And the, the green line is um, uh, one that sort of minimizes the distance from the beginning state to the end state, uh, whereas the blue line, the solid line, is one that sort of goes back and forth. Which is a better search? Don? Orange. No, orange. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tricked me. Yeah. It depends. Ah, the solution. Ah, that's the answer to all the research questions, right? <laughs> it depends. It depends. Kahneman and Tversky would say that it's just a peak and end that you average over. Okay, but let, let's let's pursue that. I, I like that. Um, so, if we're using sort of mean average precision or something, and we average, uh, then the straighter line kind of wins. No, no, no. You, you don't. The length it doesn't matter. It's how happy you were on average. How happy you were at the end, which is all you'll remember, uh -huh. and you take the average of those. So your vacation should be short, happy at the end. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Don? <laughs> well, uh, I, I mean, maybe it doesn't involve suffering, though. Yeah, 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 Eric? Okay. Right. So more knowledge sort of covered. Yeah, in other words, the green line looks like I did something and I now did exactly something. Whereas the orange line looks like you encountered it in some process that may have conflicted. And you had some emotional experience in that. Uh, Don and then Gene and Nick.
Okay? Gene? I was going to say, so it sounds like learning is the friction of the process. Ah, okay, good. Good summary. Yeah, I like that. Dick? I was going to say that Sure does. Right. I think that if I wanted to collaborate process iterative and the well, especially if I was going to add time to the Okay. Sure. Yeah. Ben, you know, going back to what Nick was saying, it's better for, oh, you know, from this perspective, is it, are we talking about system designers? Are we talking about better for a user? And they're not always the same. The user. I, I'm, I'm only talking about the user here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Other people would like to say their answers. Well, well uh, I, maybe I should have just started with this, and this could have been the whole discussion. Um, uh, the, I, I, th I think this is the kind of, of question we, we're sort of not really grappling with enough. Uh, and and uh, certainly it depends, but uh, this actually might be a way to disambiguate uh, sort of maybe exploratory searches from known item searches, right? If you look at some behaviors and you see this kind of, I mean, it's like sort of, I mean, if you think of this from driving around, if I just need to go to the grocery store and I know where it is, then I just want the shortest route. But, you know, if it's kind of a nice day, and I, especially if I'm on my bike and, you know, I'm not quite in such a hurry, then the covering more distance actually is more gratifying, right? So, yes, the task matters, the context matters. Um, uh, but the trouble is that too often we're put in, in boxes in which we have to say, this is better according to a rubric that is checked off by this community. Okay, and it's and it's that sort of thing that I think um, we suffer from uh, all too often. Okay, so last slide, I promise. Uh, what might help? Um, lots of stuff. Um, certainly, better experimental apparatus. Uh, you know, more. Let's share more stuff. I mean, I keep hearing about you know you've got to save your data, and if you want an NSF grant, you have to say how you're going to do it, right? And and that's great, um, but. How can, we, how can we save our data? I, I can't even run the old relation browser demos anymore because the servers don't you know, run that level of Tomcat that you know, doesn't run on the latest version of Red Hat that you, know, you go, oh, I don't want to deal with that. We'll just make a video and put the videos <laughs> up, right? And, and so how do, we, how do we save, how do we share the experiences, the processes? So those of you who participated in the challenge, fantastic work. I mean, I'm, I'll bet all of you spent more than 10 or 15 minutes. All right? Now, what happened on all of those, uh, to all of those discussions, to all of that thinking, of all of that processing that uh, took place? You know, you're going to have a little bit of time to explain what you did, but not enough, right? So how can we begin to share those processes? Um, you know, is there some kind of... You know, repository that uh, this community should build that talks about wacko experiments run awry or um, um, you know what I wish I had done after having done this and here's what I did. Um, I, I think we could probably get some leverage by trying to, sh to do more sharing of all sorts of, of records. Uh, I kind of like video so I'll emphasize that a, 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 a more than perhaps others, but you know, we, should, we should do a better job of this. Um, can we use crowdsourcing? You know, probably half of you have used Mechanical Turk for something, but you know, are there other things we can do to make sort of uh, get people involved and capture those processes? Um, shared instruments, you know, you know, we all create surveys and, and, and instruments. Um, uh, even in my own experience, getting 
the, the, you know, the incoming students who are going to do the next thing to share their uh, MySQL um, uh, database and uh, PHP code that captures the study, the experimental study. Now, very difficult. Um, uh, uh, longitudinal traces of things. Can we like have explanations or recordings of processes that you know go go for more than a semester or go for more than that one study? Uh, I'm especially thinking about individual people. Um, you know, I'm all for fMRIs and biometric kinds of of data. I think uh, you know we learn uh, from those things. They're expensive. Uh, we don't know how to really do them very well, uh, but I'm sure we'll see um, uh, more attempts. And you know what um, uh, sort of came up in, in several of the posters. Um, wouldn't you love to have all of the queries that a hundred random people do on their iPhone uh, with uh, Siri? Uh, and, uh, or the Android um, uh, voice. I'm sure. I gotta remember where I am. Uh, 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 you know, what could we learn from that? What would you do with that data? Okay, so um, lots of challenges, not the only ones. Uh, we've made a tremendous amount of progress from those early Eric search days. Uh, there's lots more to learn. Uh, last, um, last week I, I, um, I was at a, 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 an event in Oliver Smithy's uh, Nobel Laureate in Medicine was uh, being interviewed by a journalism uh, student and she goes, well, he's, uh, he's about 80. And um, she said, uh, are you still working? And he said, um, young lady, I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> I've been having fun. I've been playing my entire life. And I suggest that what we do, our work, you know, we, we sweat over getting those papers accepted and agonizing uh, over how to design those studies and do our analyses. But uh, in the end, this is fun. And um, let's have more fun. Thank you. <laughs>